Chapter 3. A Soldier by Destiny After almost five years in Peru, I came back to Panama as an adult, having matured greatly, thanks to the military academy and the tutelage of my brother. But the military still meant nothing to me. My plan was to settle in and find a job. I landed one in the International Geodesic Service. First, I received additional technical training in cartography, and then was assigned to the field as an engineer. I was well suited to the job. Our mission was to set up delicate cartographic equipment, an oceanographic monitor. We were operating at the time on the Pacific side in Asuero province at Punta Guanico. The equipment had to be placed along the rocks at low tide, but the rocks were slippery and the soft sandy shore was loose. What was needed was a person light enough to walk on the rocks without sinking into the soft ocean floor. Most of my colleagues were older, fat, and tall, but I was perfect for the job. At about 100 pounds, I was the smallest man there. So they tied a life belt around my waist, and out I went, onto the rocks, hoping they would support my weight. I was successful. I was enjoying this work, had pretty much forgotten about taking the military seriously, and was dragging my feet and signing up with the National Guard as the national police had become known. I was earning enough money for a few luxuries, like a car and some decent clothes. I also had a girlfriend. Life was treating me well. I had settled into a routine and was looking forward to a solid, quiet life. I had no idea how dramatically things would change. It all began during Lenten carnival celebrations in 1962, shortly after our return from Peru. I drove into Cologne with my girlfriend and a few other people for some party hopping around town. We were on our way to the first stop when, all of a sudden, we got a flat tire. Everything was closed for the holiday, and I didn't have a spare, so I started walking. We happened to be close to the local military barracks, and I headed in that direction. I had friends there and knew they'd be able to lend a hand. I walked into the headquarters looking for my friends. At first, I was disappointed that only a few people were around. But then there were some scrambling and orders being barked in the distance, followed by the sound of people approaching. Attention, I heard someone say. Instinctively, new cadet graduate that I was, even though I wasn't in uniform and hadn't reported for duty, I snapped too, clicking my heels as I did so. In strode the battalion commander, already a famous man within the military. He was tall with a prominent brow and flashing eyes. He seemed to energize the room. His name was Omar Torrijos. Torrijos had already garnered a reputation for being one of the new leaders within the National Guard, which was a far different institution back then. Largely subservient to business interests, it was still the repressive organization it had been during my student days, capable of putting down protest movements on behalf of the United States and the wealthy classes. Torrijos, however, had a reputation of being an independent thinker and was well-respected among younger recruits like me. Panama is a small country, and at the time, there were no more than several thousand people in the National Guard. Very few were academy officers, and fewer still had gone to Peruvian military academy. Most men knew one another. I certainly knew who Torrijos was, and Torrijos had heard of me from various sources. First, I was one of a handful of cadets who had trained in Peru. Second, I was the brother of a diplomat who was fairly well known. Perhaps, also, I had gained a reputation for having a mind of my own. Torrijos seemed to recognize me, although I didn't think we had ever met. You're Noriega, aren't you? Yes, sir. Come upstairs with me. I followed Torrijos to his office, forgetting all about my car, my girlfriend, and the party. There I was, fresh out of school, a miserable second lieutenant who hadn't even started his formal service. And suddenly the local commander is taking me along with him. There's a big difference between a major and a second lieutenant and I was in a state of shock. We walked up to the second floor of the barracks where Torrijos had his office, which is, by the way, still preserved as it was then. He addressed me informally. Let's have a drink, Torrijos said. Very well, sir, at your orders, I replied as we were taught in cadet school. I'll have a drink. But Torrijos swept past the formalities and the atmosphere became more casual. He said he had heard about my stint in Peru and asked me about my career and my future. I was honest with him. Well, sir, I've been involved in an engineering project with the International Geodesic Service, and I'm enjoying it, I said. I haven't really been focusing on the National Guard. That's happening to everybody these days, but it won't always be the same, Torrijos said, without making himself clear. 
There are some of us who are looking for a new era ahead in the National Guard. He left it at that conspiratorial tone and changed the subject. Listen, he said, I'm the guest of honor at the Toldo, the base carnival ball. Why don't you come along? Well, I have some friends with me, I answered. That's okay, bring them along. I gathered up my friends and we went off to the party. During the holiday period, we hold parties and dances and masquerades of all kinds, starting the weekend before and leading up to the big celebration on the Tuesday before Lent. He had invited me to the big carnival party in Cologne. It was a great thrill to be swept along with him. At a certain point in the evening, he brought up business once more. You see, he said, there are those of us who believe that the National Guard could be more than it has been, that it could be restructured, he told me, still being vague. Well, even to say this much was getting close to trouble. What he was saying, in so many words, was that there was talk of rebellion. The leader of the guard at the time, Bolivar Vallarino, was holding a conservative line and would not have tolerated a movement for change within the Corps. I was vague and theoretical in what I said as well. I think that my military training has nothing to do with what I see of the National Guard as a police force, I said. They run in opposite directions. Being a policeman has nothing to do with being a professional soldier. The conversation went on like this for a while, until Torrijos said, So now that you've graduated, what will you be doing? Would you like to work for me? He asked. This was a difficult question. My thoughts had been far from the military. My job was very satisfying. On the other hand, this encounter had taken me entirely by surprise. I found the conversation about the military very much in line with my feelings of nationalism with my analysis of what the National Guard could be. I was unconsciously captured by Torrijos' style, so much that I heard myself reply to him enthusiastically. Yes, sir, very much, but I'm supposed to be starting a geography course with the International Geodesic Service, and I do have my job there. No problem, was all he said. That was it. The offer of working for him seemed to get lost in the partying. Carnival came and went. I returned to the coast, back to my mapping work, slipping and sliding along the rocks on the coast, happy to follow my career working for the geodesic service. It was considered a plum job. I was paid well, I was getting praise for my work, and I was getting to know the heart of the country. About four months later, I got an urgent telegram from Luis Carlos, who had by this time returned to Panama as well. The National Guard is commissioning four officers, and your name is among them the telegram said, get home as soon as you can. Torrijos had not forgotten his offer. He had gotten in touch with my family, told them about the opening for officers, and summoned me back to headquarters. What will it take to get you to start working for me? He asked. Well, sir, I told him, they're paying me $500 a month. That was a great deal of money for a young bachelor like me. I was living with relatives and didn't need much to live on. Well, fine. Come work for me and we'll find a job and some money for you, Torrijos said, adding that he would discuss the matter with General Vallarino. And that's how I started working for Torrijos. Intuitively, he saw in me someone he could trust. His trust paid off for both of us. I was devoted to him. He knew that I was committed to doing anything he asked or ordered me to do. But I was by no means his servant or sitting at his knee. I got no special treatment. In fact, whenever I did something wrong, he spared me no punishment. There was the time, for instance, when I was still a rookie, that a couple of friends and I decided to jump the wall of the barracks in Cologne and go out partying. It was December 31st, 1962, the same year that Torrijos called me in to work for him. The others were Pedro Ayala, a full lieutenant, and Agustin Barrios and Luis Turber, both second lieutenants like me. Cologne was filled with clubs and bars. It was the perfect environment for a bunch of young soldiers out for a good time. But we were confined to base for some disciplinary reason. However, it was New Year's Eve and we couldn't stand being away from the action. So we made a run for it. Let's go dancing, Ayala said. We called some girls we knew and went out partying. There are plenty of night spots in Cologne, but we picked the wrong one. After a short time, an old girlfriend spotted me with these friends and started making a scene. I'd been avoiding her recently, and she was angry and ready to fight. I thought you told me you were confined to base, she said. Looks like you snuck out. I told her to mind her own business. We started arguing. Okay, fine, she said, looking at the other girls. Go ahead and cheat on me. She walked away in a huff. I didn't think any more about it. We stayed out all night. The boys and I slipped back onto base at dawn. 
Everything would have been fine except my old girlfriend was out for revenge. She made up some story and told it to her father, who unfortunately was a member of the National Assembly. With hardly any sleep, we were hauled into the office, charged with having been AWOL. Torrijos already had gotten a call from Commander Vallarino, saying that the assemblyman in question had called to protest my treatment of his daughter. The girl complained that I had insulted her and had been disrespectful to her in public. Vallarino's message to Torrijos was a simple one. Find Noriega and throw him out of the National Guard. My career didn't matter to this politician. He was abusing his power as a member of the ruling class by mixing personal business with someone's career. Get rid of him, was all he said to Vallarino. And Vallarino passed the message on to Torrijos. What's this all about? Torrijos asked. I'm not going to defend myself, I answered. I accept whatever punishment you want to impose. Torrijos was very angry. I had messed up his New Year's, and he had to deal with Vallarino instead of getting the day off. You're right, sir, he told Vallarino. He should be thrown out. He went AWOL, and instead of defending himself, he stood in front of me and said he had nothing to say, that he agreed with whatever our punishment might be. Torrijos told me that Vallarino said, and I always remembered it, I like this officer because he upholds his honor and his military demeanor. Punish him within the Corps. So Torrijos came back to me, shaking his head, his anger diffused. Will you take a look at this? He said. I'm ready to let him get rid of you, and he saves your hide. From 1962 to 1969, I rose in the ranks. From lieutenant, I became a captain, then a major. They were important years during which time I became very close to Torrijos. I learned about his dreams and his goals. He was on the road to becoming the leader of the National Guard. What struck me most was his humanity and his ability to thrive in adversity. Torrijos was transferred from Cologne to Turiqui in February 1963, about 10 months after our Lenten meeting. It was in Turiqui that he gathered around him the young officers he would employ for change within the military in the country. I was one of the chosen. Torrijos had seen the extreme poverty and social injustice in Cologne, where a majority of people were left in the shadow of the giant U.S. fruit and shipping exporters, like the United Fruit Company, which controlled the Panamanian economy along with his political leaders. In Chiriqui, he was determined to promote the improvements in the lot of Panamanian workers. He became an activist military leader like the country had never seen. He was interested in everything from highway improvements to rural development. The Chiriqui National Guard Command became a social development center. Torrijos believed that the key was public participation in government. He organized local councils to discuss how to raise money for public works projects. He met with banana workers to discuss their problems, and he recommended that they form committees to strengthen their unions and demand better conditions. Soon, Torrijos was receiving a torrent of requests from the common folk asking for help in setting up sewage treatment, clean water supplies, and other projects. He reached out to the local city councilmen to incorporate this action within the local political structure. Perhaps the most dramatic example of his innovation was in our dealings with the guerrilla insurgents who plagued both the interior of the country and the cities periodically in the late 1960s. The guerrillas were sometimes leftists with a cause, sometimes Guaymi Indians fighting for autonomy, Sometimes mercenaries supported by the Arnulfistas, supporters of our perennial populist civilian leader, Arnulfo Arias. It was an emotional time for Torrijos, and I lived through it by his side. I played an important role in putting down the guerrilla insurgencies. I was sent to Chiriqui as zone commander with the mission of combating the Arias-backed rebellion there. It wasn't easy. We lost men, and it was a tough, emotionally draining fight. These were hit-and-run skirmishes, often cross-border raids from Costa Rica. I remember one in particular. In late 1968, a team of Arnulfista insurgents launched an attack on the house of Eduardo Gonzalez in Boquete. Gonzalez was the wealthiest, most prominent politician in Chiriqui. I saved the lives of Eduardo Gonzalez, his wife, Marta, and his daughter that day we had obtained information that an attack would be taking place on a prominent target. Apparently, these men decided they would serve notice on the populace that they would be challenging wealthy persons in Panama who supported Torrijos. A 50-man commando team, led by a Costa Rican man, Antonio Aguilar, El Macho, launched an assault on Gonzalez's ranch. 
My men and I repulsed the attack and saved Gonzalez and his family. Following that first attack, there was a series of border skirmishes, many of them led by an Uruguayan mercenary named Walter Sandinas, who went marauding throughout the zone, attacking and hanging opponents of Arnulfo Arias. Our men fought bravely, and I was an active squad leader in the field with my men. When it was over, Torrijos turned around and sent me to reach out to guerrilla fighters, who fled in defeat to exile in Honduras and Costa Rica. You must extend a hand to them personally. You must tell them that you personally guarantee their return to Panama. I went along with it, but there were perhaps 400 fighters and their families living outside the country, fleeing reprisals and exile. What a reaction when these people actually saw me in Torrijos' name, welcomed them back to Panama and offered them the hand of friendship. To have a high-ranking officer reach out to them was a seal of approval, a guarantee that they could come home. And they did come home, under the patronage of Torrijos, who had this remarkable quality of forgiving his enemies. The guerrilla threat eliminated, Torrijos launched into a rehabilitation plan. Restoration of guerrilla ranches destroyed in the violence, grants and loans for rebuilding, grants for their children, indemnification to the families of those who had been killed. Again, this is the enemy we are talking about. There was an Indian rebel commander in particular who struck me as a natural leader, Ariosto Gonzalez. He was an older man, but he fought in the mountains with mythic energy. When he engaged with National Guard troops, it was as if he staged the entire attack by himself. His strategies were so intricate that nobody knew how he managed to get from one mountain to the next. He seemed to be a magician. Gonzalez became legendary among the National Guard troops, who regarded him with a mixture of mystery and fear. Gonzalez was eventually killed in a National Guard ambush. After his movement was halted, Torrijos set out to find who this man was and whether he had a family. Gonzalez's widow and two children were living in San Jose, Costa Rica. Torrijos ordered that they receive a government pension on behalf of their fallen loved one. This was highly unusual in guerrilla warfare. I doubt that you'll hear much about that type of humanitarianism in many other countries as they dealt with the decline of their guerrilla insurgencies. But that was Torrijos. His humanism was broad and he broke the mold. There was a military coup in 1968, and a year later, Torrijos was in sole command of the government. By that time, it had been shown unequivocally that my loyalty was unswerving. I can send Noriega out on any mission, from buying a present for a woman to marching into battle, Torrijos would tell people. Noriega will always be there. 